Let's have a look at some of the missiles the German designed for anti-air duty during World War II. Now a word of caution is advised. Because these weapons were mainly prototypes that developed as tests were conducted, a lot of diverging information can be found. Keep that in mind as I give this introduction. Now the Germans began to theorize about the use of a rocket-propelled warhead against enemy planes in the 1920s, but concrete plans did not materialize until the mid-1930s. While the basic concept sounded promising to visionaries, this idea did not enjoy unilateral support. Quite a number of people in the Reichsluftfahrtsministerium, that's the Reichs Air Ministry, were initially against the project, seeing in it nothing more but glorified fireworks. Of course, as the years progressed and World War II was in full swing, priorities shifted and the use of surface-to-air rockets and missiles became more supported. The Germans called them Flakraketen, AA rockets. During World War II, quite a number of rockets and missiles were thus developed. Here's a short introduction of some of them. The Germans had the Typhoon, literally translating into Typhoon. Feuerlilie, that's fire lily. Hecht, which translates to pike, and with that I mean the fish, not the weapon. Rheintochter, translating to daughter of the Rhine. The Rhine, of course, being a river creating a natural border between Germany and France. Schmetterling, butterfly. Enzian, gentian, a mountain flower. Another, Feuerlilie. And Wasserfall, meaning waterfall. Of course, all these Flakraketen differed in quite a number of ways. For example, Typhoon was unguided, being literally a dumbfire rocket to be used en masse. Feuerlilie and Hecht were flight stabilized, giving some control over their path, and the remaining missiles were radio guided, although the Wasserfall could also fly independently, at least in theory. Let's have a more detailed look at some of these rockets. And let's start with the Wasserfall, the only supersonic missile in our selection. Essentially, it's a miniature V2 in many ways. It had a height of 7.8 meters, a width of 2.5 meters, and weighed around 3.5 tons. It could reach speeds of just under 800 meters per second with enough fuel for 45 seconds of thrust. Taking off vertically, it mounted an explosive warhead of 100 kilograms. In early 1945, all work on the Wasserfall was halted. After the war, the design choices of the Wasserfall actually influenced later surface-to-air and air-to-air -air missiles. Let's move on to the Rheintochter, the first subsonic missile in the mix. Standing at 6.3 meters and with a width of 3 meters, it was still one of the larger rockets. Weighing 1.75 tons on takeoff, it would be fired off at an angle by using a launch carriage, achieving speeds of up to 310 meters per second. Having a thrust duration of 30 seconds, it launches itself at enemy planes with a warhead containing around about 150 kilograms of high explosive content. The Rheintochter was tested, but was not deemed ready for operational use. The Schmetterling is probably the most eccentric design. 3.6 meters tall and 2 meters wide, it was a light design with a total weight of 420 kilograms. It would be fired off at an angle, flying for around 50 seconds at up to 210 meters per second. It only carried a 42 kilogram warhead. However, it was probably the most advanced design and was also tested in an air-to-air -air role. Now, it was put on order and was very close to seeing operational service during the war, but the German capitulation put an end to that. Moving on to the Enzian. This was a smaller, more horizontally challenged missile standing at 3.5 meters with a width of 4 meters, bringing 1.5 tons to the scale. It was developed by Messerschmitt, and its similarity to the rocket fighter ME163 is clear. It could be fired vertically or at an angle by using a launch carriage and had enough fuel for 70 seconds of thrust and reached a speed of 280 meters per second. It also had a very impressive warhead of 550 kilograms and that's about a third of its total weight. Now, as you have noticed, a lot of these missiles have quite a substantial warhead. This is because the Germans recognized that at this stage, a direct hit was very unlikely. So a lot of these missiles relied on essentially shrapnel damage to get the job done. Let us assume that one of these missiles was ready for operational use. This is how the Germans envisioned a battery of the Rheintochter R3 missile. Now you have the Batterie Befehlstelle, that's a command post, including all the computational equipment necessary. Directly attached to it are Ordnungsgeräte, those are tracking devices, to locate the enemy bomber squadron. Then you have the Funkmessgerät Ziel and the Funkmessgerät Lenk. That's radar and radio guidance, responsible for actually guiding the missile to the target. Now, the command post tracks the enemy planes and eventually sends out the signal Feuer frei to four Rheintochter batteries and they would fire. The batteries were spaced out by around 50 meters and they have a storage facility for more missiles around 40 meters from each of them. The whole battery is thus quite localized. Now, the question is, of course, would these weapons be any better at taking out enemy bomber formations than conventional flak? Let's ask that question 
to military history visualized. Although the missiles could be seen as a waste of resources, we should also not forget that the alternatives, besides the fighters, weren't particularly efficient. The question is, could have been a missile be more efficient? Well, let's look at some data. According to a report from the Quartermaster General, for every downed plane, 16,000 shots of the 8.8 cm FLAC 36 were needed, 8,500 shots of the FLAC 8.841, and 6,000 shots of the 10.5 FLAC were necessary. In terms of explosive, this meant 62, 51, and 45 tons were necessary for each downed plane. Note that explosive in this case means both the propellant and the charge in the warhead. In contrast, one missile could require about 2.1 tons of explosives. So if one out of 20 missiles would hit, it would be, have been more efficient than a 10.5 cm flak, at least in terms of explosives. Yet the missile was also a high-end weapon that required high-grade radio equipment and electronics. Additionally, since it was a rather unproven technology, it probably wouldn't have been much more feasible than flak guns for at least a few years. Well, that is that certainly answered. If you are interested in learning more about the Flak Raketen, I highly recommend this video by Military History Visualized. I do hope that you enjoyed this look at some of the lesser known tech from World War II. If you did, consider supporting me on Patreon, as it allows me to invest more time into this channel by taking it as a full-time occupation. Special thanks go to Military History Visualized for his help, so make sure to check out his in-depth look at the German Flak Raketen here. Or, if you feel like watching an in-depth analysis on the American F4F Wildcat and the Japanese Zero, click here. As always, have a great day, good hunting, and see you on the sky.